Welcome to Changing the Perception of Blindness, One Conversation at a Time, where we aim to break down barriers, demystify blindness, and promote real and lasting change. Join host David Steinmetz as he connects us with professionals who are making a positive impact in the community. These leaders help empower individuals who are blind or have other disabilities to live a full and inclusive life. Let's lean in as David kicks off today's conversation. Good morning and welcome to this episode of Changing the Perception of Blindness, One Conversation at a Time. I'm your host, David Steinmetz. I'd like to first thank Arizona Industries for the Blind for being our sponsor of this show. AIB is an enterprise nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering people who are blind or low vision to achieve their version of the American dream by creating and sustaining employment opportunities. October is really an exciting month in the disability community. We celebrate National Disability Employment Awareness Month, or NDEAM, and it's an opportunity to recognize the talents and contributions that people who are blind or have other disabilities bring to the workforce. It's also an opportunity to thank those employers who have uh, put an emphasis in their DEINA efforts to ensure that they're including people with disabilities. It's an opportunity to to highlight the work that we do, as well as also to say that there's more work to be done. Part of this show, Changing Perception of Blindness, is really to bring that awareness that people who are blind have really put in a lot of effort into getting a job. From going through the adjustment process, if you've just lost your vision later in life, to going through all the vocational training, how to gain the skills to work a computer, for example, without a mouse, or you know, imagine you're sitting at your, at your workstation today, turn off the, the screen. How are you going to navigate that, that screen and that application? So uh, we have to learn those techniques. Um, I got your new Microsoft Office and things like that, but now you have to do it without a mouse or without a screen. So it's uh, kind of like relearning everything all over again. We also have to learn, you know, how are we going to live independently? How are we going to make sure that we're prepared for the day? All these things go into getting, you know, job ready, really. And so it's important that employers, when you're looking at uh, hiring someone who is blind, really understand, you know, on paper, they have all the skill sets. They got to the uh, interview sitting in front of you, and if you're looking and seeing that there are uh, other candidates with equal skill sets, but if you look between the lines, what you'll see is somebody that has had to adapt, overcome many different challenges. You'll find that that person is more creative problem solver because we've had to solve many, many, many issues on our own and figure ways out. So if you're looking for someone uh, who is fits that bill, then make sure you're continuing to look into the disability community. And talking about all the things that go into training and getting somebody job ready, I'm really fortunate fortunate to have two experts in the field, people that I really admire and are doing some great things in the community, uh, for the blindness community. And so I'd like to introduce my guest today. I have here Ms. Julie Oliver from Foundation for Blind Children, and Mr. Steve Tepper from the Arizona Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Welcome to this episode. Thank you for having us. Thank you. For our audience sake, let's just, if you wouldn't mind providing some of your background and how you got into FBC. Sure. My name is Julie Oliver, as you said. I'm the Vice President of Programming at the Foundation for Blind Children, and What that means is I oversee all of our programming and services from our early intervention programming, which is those first encounters a family may have when their baby is diagnosed with a visual impairment, through our New Horizons programming, which is our support group and our training for retirees. I have been with the foundation since 2018. Prior to that, I was a executive with a healthcare data analytics company. So that line is not necessarily one that seems natural, but 
prior to doing data analytics for 16 years, I was in the nonprofit world. I worked for Boys Town USA and also the YMCA. And I got to a point where I said, corporate is great, um, doing some great things. I've learned a ton, but I feel like I am not doing the work that I want to do. And, and that's when I truly drove past the Foundation for Blind Children on my way to work and happened to see a ad on LinkedIn. And I applied and here I am. Awesome. And Steve, if you please introduce yourself and your background, please. Sure. I'm Steve Tepper, uh, Executive Director for Arizona Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Once upon a time, I ran Arizona's largest fully inclusive summer camp for children living with developmental disabilities. And like Julie also saw an ad on LinkedIn, I didn't drive by. And really, I wanted to get people living with disabilities. And this opportunity presented itself. And I was incredibly fortunate that I was um, chosen for this role. Thank you, Steve. And uh, for full disclosure, uh, I am fortunate enough to be a board member at uh, ACBVI. Um, the organization does wonderful things, and it's an opportunity uh, for me to continue to work in the community and help people live the lives that they want, whether it's through work or if our population, an older population, are looking for support groups or services and social recreation. So it's a great organization, and I'm, I'm appreciative to be part of that. So, guys, as we're talking about National Disability Employment Month, and it's important to, to note that, you know, with such a high unemployment rate, you know, 70%, we say, are not working, that either they've been trying to find a job, facing all these barriers, you know, denial, 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 so they just decide to leave the workforce. They may be people that are working, but are underemployed. And then there's those that just have not seeked employment. You know, I'd like to get the conversation rolling with this. How do we, one, make a difference for those that are working age, that want to work, but aren't? How do we tap into that market for today's labor force? Any ideas or thoughts on that? Well, I think it really starts with education. Um, I think people it, by nature have biases and they make an assumption because of a past experience and um, maybe not always founded in fact or or evidence. And and so one of the things that we as agencies that support the blind and visually impaired or disability community need to do is, is get in front of employers and share how individuals who are blind or visually impaired do things. They just do them differently. And I think once someone sees how someone does something that maybe breaks down a concern or a fear that they're not going to be able to do something or they, they're going to misstep doing something. So to me, it's a lot about education and awareness to say, yeah, this is a possibility. Again, they're just going to do it slightly differently. Yeah, it's so true because, you know, oftentimes that the main reason for the show, right, is how do we bring awareness to such a larger audience? I say it's one conversation at a time that was always being asked whether I'm getting in and out of a rideshare vehicle or standing at the bus stop. How do you do X, Y, Z? You're on your way to work. Oh my gosh, how's that work? And I try and explain that to them and, and people still really have a hard time envisioning that. So I think having the conversation, but sometimes I think people get afraid mm -hmm. to have that conversation. Either, I don't know if it's, you know, today's climate or or what, but I think sometimes people have that that fear of asking the question. Yeah, I would agree with that. I I think that, well, at the foundation, one of the things that I we get the opportunity to do is work with transition age students. And in, in the world of vocational rehabilitation, what transition means is individuals ages 14 to 21. And so when you start having the conversations with individuals in that age range and sharing with them how they need to share their disability and how they need to share how they do things and how they can bring to the table an, another experience that they had that may not be related to work, but the, how they overcame that obstacle when they're telling their stories with confidence that allows other people to have confidence in them. Hmm. I really think Julie makes uh, great points, but I also think that there is, in addition to that, 
there has to be on our end that extra step of going to employers and bringing them in so that they can see what is happening in our center, right? So I was touring somebody a few weeks ago. We walked by one of our rooms and there was a completely blind student teaching a completely deaf and blind student how to install a new hard drive on a computer, right? I can't do that. I'm fully sighted. I couldn't do that without watching numerous YouTube videos and still probably wouldn't get it right. And so when you walk by and you see something like that, you kind of get opened up to the possibilities of what our clients are capable of. And, you know, outside of driving and flying a plane, our client, our clients can do anything, right? Those are the two hard stops. But other than that, and, and I think Julie's overcome the flying the plane. I was just going <laughs> to say, we've already done that. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> but, but outside of that, I should say flying a plane by yourself, maybe? Yeah. Outside of that, our clients really have no limits. And in a lot of cases, have unbelievable talents and are able to do things that I couldn't dream of. And so it really is a question of helping people to see what that capacity and capability is to overcome those inherent prejudices that, that Julie was speaking of. Steve's right. I mean, it's that it's that experience of seeing, and, and I can tell you how many people I've had come in and quietly observe as our, our staff, who 70% of my staff is visually impaired, has some degree of a visual impairment, teaching other adults who are getting ready to go back into the workforce how to you know, do life and and do their technology. And I think the first time that you watch someone use a screen reader with a earbud in one ear, and, you know, I'm sitting next to, to David right now, and he's got his headset on, but he also has an earbud in another ear that he's listening to his computer. And the skill and focus that it takes to do that, I don't have that. And so allowing people to see and believe, I think, is Steve's spot on. Yeah, I agree with both of you. When I'm out talking to organizations and bringing awareness of, of blindness and, you know, what uh, AIB does on a daily basis, and they'll say, well, what's the aha moment? And I say, well, it's hard for me to describe it. You have to see it. We've, based on society norms or culture or just not having an experience, we have this perception that because your eyes don't work, Nothing else does. Your, everything that you've gained in life in your past is gone. And so having people come in, tour, or working with a client of your organizations and just seeing it, I think it's the biggest, it has, it makes the biggest impact in, in my mind. And, you know, that's my aha moment when people walk in and go, oh my gosh, we had some from Amazon come in tour and they walked into our warehouse and they're like, oh, this looks like Amazon. And it is. It's the same thing. We're just using my personal opinion, a better workforce. And so I think it's hard for employers to to get over that or just the general public. Right? You see somebody walking down the street using a cane or a guide dog that there's something to be looked at or, or you know what I mean? I even see that sometimes with the students or clients that come through our program. Um, we have a, I have a, one of my um, instructors, he's, uh, has no vision. He is a assistive technology instructor, which means he teaches people how to use um, JAWS, Fusion, low vision aids so that you can, you know, work in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all of the things. And he is an exceptional traveler. And multiple students have said, no, there's no way that you have no vision. That doesn't make sense. Like you're fooling us. And it's kind of this running joke that the students think that he's really pulling their leg because he's so proficient and just just this effortlessness. And, um, and I love that about him because he's this kind of North Star for our students to strive for to say like, you can, you can do the same. You can be exactly the same. So true. And, and that's part of, I think, it's not just employers, right? Julie, you mentioned about confidence, right? And, and that comes from that, you know, maybe that uh, effortless in his orientation and mobility, understanding where he is in, in the world and how is he going to get there. That confidence in that comes out and makes it look effortless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think different than, than maybe some fields, although, you know, it is changing across the workforce in what 
you know, the agencies that Julie and I represent, lived experience is, is top of it. And so two thirds of our staff are blind or visually impaired. You know, we also serve people living with combined vision and hearing loss. So 20% of our staff are deaf or hard of hearing as well, including one who is, is deaf blind. And so, you know, I think in so many different areas, lived experience really, really counts. And the pendulum until very recently had swung the other way. It was more about um, degrees and certifications. And I think we're, we're heading back as a general workforce towards work experience, you know, towards lived experience. And it really makes an enormous difference in, in what we do. I agree. I mean, there is that mindset that education is, is that pathway. And it is important in, in a lot of areas. You have to go to school and get a degree because you're going to earn more money or this or that. But if you have that and you don't have any work experience and it's really hard and that was kind of a lesson I tried to tell my kids about is, you know, we got through college. Okay, now I expect, you know, a six figure salary and all these benefits and well, you still have to put in the time. And if you don't put in that time and utilize the skills that you have learned through education, then it doesn't, you know, that's the only way to move forward. And it's interesting that you think that that shift towards life lessons or um, learned life through um, experience. Is that something that you think is different? Do you think that that background that someone who uh, is blind can add values, Steve, to an organization besides the education part? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is not only uh, relevant in our field. I think if you are, you know, in recovery, Having someone who's gone through recovery is, is hugely important. I think if you're coming out of incarceration, I think if you're looking for work, I think everybody needs somebody who is a mentor for them or mentors. And I truly believe for anyone to be successful, regardless of ability, they need a village behind them. And so I think lived experience, and, and maybe this is controversial, I think lived experience means more and the book learning and the certifications and all those other pieces, I think it really trumps everything at the end of the day. So when you have those mentors, and I know I have and have had mine, um, I want to be like them. I want to get to where they are. I want to be as good as they are. And so, you know, despite the fact that most of my mentors at this stage have retired, I'm still in touch with them. I still talk to them all the time, and I'm still desperately trying to be as good at what I do as they were at what they did. And that guides me more than anything that I could have learned in terms of technical skills. And I think when you are talking about somebody who's been through exactly what you're going through and they've been able to overcome it and have success in that, that plays across fields. And I think it certainly plays in our field. Yeah, interesting thoughts. Julia, anything that... You know, no, I, I would, I 100% agree with Steve, which is hard to say, but I do. <laughs> um, and it's, Steve and I are, are both on uh, Maricopa County Public Health Community Advisory Boards, and we were just at a cab yesterday, and it, all three um, geographic areas that are being represented, it's all about, you know, stigma, stigma reduction and and creating community navigators and having individuals, whether it's in mental health or in healthcare, that look sound and have had a lived experience like me. And and that's no different in our field. I, I totally agree, right? We talk about inclusion. Really what we're talking about is inclusion and having those shared experiences. And I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a minute and kind of go go wild here. At the same time, though, how do we stay away from saying, David, just because you're blind, you're the mentor, you know best. How do we stay away from putting a box or label or putting somebody in a position to be that, I don't want to say token, but right mm-hmm. in that position of uh, because you're, because you have a disability, because you're X, Y, Z, you're the, you um, are the expert and so forth. Well, I mean, I think just in general, we, none of us should be defined by one thing or one attribute or or our disability. And so we're made up of many pieces and parts. And so I'm visually impaired and this. And, and I think the importance of those ands 
and to show all of the successes and um, experience that you have. Um, and oh, by the way, I happen to be, um, I happen to have a disability. So I think it's all of those and statements. Um, and it isn't, you, you putting people in a box is just further creating those stigmas. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have to make a conscious effort not to do that. Yeah, I would also add, David, you know, I, and Julie and I, I, I think are in exactly the same place on this. We're looking for amazing instructors, period. Mm -hmm. But if all things are equal, or if they're even close to being equal, we're always going to take the person with lived experience over the person who doesn't have any. Mm -hmm. If they're not equal, we're going to take the great instructor every single time. But all of the people that Julie, that Julie and I are really privileged enough to work with, they're all licensed, they're all experienced, they, they all have everything that you would want, and they have that lived experience. And I just think it, it's a difference maker. I agree. And, and I don't disagree with you either way, uh, either of you. Um, <clears throat> I totally agree. There are groups and, and beliefs that may be putting that emphasis on that. And so I like, Julie, how you, the and statements, right? And we talked, I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, about having all the same skill sets, um, all the practical skills, et cetera, but the work that you've had to do or the life that you've lived to get there does add some value to, should add value to the workforce and things that you do. And for an employer, for a hiring manager, how, how do we make that conversation easier for them to really make, recognize that? No, I think that they have to see it, right? And so I think a, a big key for our industry is internships. Julie and I both, any opportunity we have, we bring people in to meet with us, right? My whole career before coming here, I went to your office. I went to your vacation home. I've flown to go meet with people. Now, everybody's got to come here in order to meet. Not because I'm so important that I don't have time to travel. It's because you won't get it otherwise. And when you get it, you can't unget it. So, you know, we have to bring people in. And I would be the first one to say, if you get one of our clients, and by ours, I mean coming graduating from our program or from Julie's program, and there are other programs available as well, you are getting somebody with, you know, we use this word grit. And it has become a really important and pivotal word in our society. And I think we misuse it all the time. Grit is that stickiness, that stick to that ability to overcome the obstacles in front of you. Um, but our people show a grit and a determination, and it is around them getting back to work. Our people desperately want to work. You know, I would love to try to figure out how to take a month off right? And just spend a month and travel and enjoy and relax. And I'd come back such a different human being. But our people are the opposite. They desperately want to get back to work. And so if you are one of our people, you're getting an unbelievably motivated employee who isn't going to be, you know, stopped by the, the things that stop met so many of us on a daily basis. And on top of it, isn't going to be delving into anything that goes on that isn't related to their success. Because once you've had something and lost it, you value it so much differently than if you had never had it. And so our people had work. Our people in particular have lost it and they are desperate to get back to it. Yeah. And I think that then what ends up happening is when you hire one of those individuals who have come through our program as an employer, you're getting an incredibly loyal person somebody that is going to come in every single day and go above and beyond and someone that's going to want to make their job, their life career with you. And as an employer, you know, that's a great thing because I don't have to, you know, re-recruit, rehire, do all of the onboarding process. And then I have this trust with someone that I, that I know I can count on. That's a, a very good point. I read recently is like, $20,000 to recruit and train an employee for a $45,000 job. And if they're not sticking around and you're constantly having to go through that process, there's a lot of money and time spent that you're not getting that return on. And for my organization, AIB, our average tenure is nine and a half years. 
And that's gone down because people who have worked, you know, 35, 40, 42 years have been retiring. And so you definitely get that value return on the training and the investment, as well as people who are blind that were not on in the workforce or maybe underemployed. The cost to the economy is like $16 billion in lost productivity. And we talk about and hear on the news all the time about we can't find talent. We can't find people to fill the jobs. It seems like employers maybe just are looking in the wrong area. I think there's also this belief that person who is uh, visually impaired can only do certain things, right? Maybe they can only work in a call center or maybe they can only do light assembly work or maybe they can only, you know, work in assistive technology. But just like Steve said, that's simply not true. Probably short of individually flying a plane and, and independently driving, there's really nothing that with the use of assistive technology and training a person can't do. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And, you know, in order for you know us to make a difference, move the needle on the unemployment, continue to get you know, your clients who spend a lot of time going through your programs back into workforce, there, there's always some some barriers that we have to overcome. And we talk about perception and whether it's our, our own perception after we've lost our vision or others, you know, others perception of what my abilities are. I, I think transportation, well, I shouldn't say, I think I know transportation is a barrier and I'm sure your clients have all faced uh, these challenges as well. Are there other barriers that you guys can think of that, are kind of contributing to the high unemployment rate among people who are blind? Well, I'll just piggyback on transportation. That is something that I get incredibly fired up about because transportation should not be a barrier to employment. And it is in the U.S. And that is a problem. And when I hear stories and I watch firsthand individuals waiting for their transportation for up to, you know, two hours, just waiting in the sun, waiting outside of an office complex. Then you've got to get on and ride two hours and then go home and then start your day again, waiting at 5 a.m. to get in. That doesn't make sense to me. And I think, you know, there's been some great progress with, you know, ride chairs and and things like Waymo and self-driving cars. But There's also something else that needs to be fixed with the transportation system because you're, that should, again, never be a barrier, not to harp on it, but it shouldn't be hard to get transportation to get to work. So that's just one of the things that continues to puzzle me in this field. I think Julie's absolutely correct. And in addition to transportation, there is a perceived cost of hiring anyone living with a disability, right? And the big thing that people see immediately, especially with visual you know, disabilities that are apparent, is you start seeing dollar signs as the person doing the hiring. And you think, we can't afford that. And so we're going to hire this other candidate instead who will cost us less. And in the end, when you really look at it and, and you do the actual math, not the, not the perceived math, Hiring our clients costs less, much less. And typically speaking, the productivity is much more. So the math actually works out greatly in your favor, but that is not the perception out there amongst hiring managers. And so, you know, the concern is I'm going to have to buy expensive software and they're going to have to have a crazy powerful computer and all these things. And, and, you know, people start racking up dollar signs that in all honesty just don't exist. Well, and I think that what happens is people create a story in their head of what they think a person's going to need. And really, all they need to do is ask. And that individual who you're going to hire already has the solution, right? They're going to tell you, oh, I I need a screen reader technology, you know, um, software package, and that's it. Or I already have it. Or, you know, I need a, um, a larger monitor. That's it. It's it's simple stuff. And, and I think, it, again, with our technology and Apple has made, you know, such great accessibility on their phones. And so much of that is already built in. But 
I think one of the things that can be helped is for people to understand that assistive technology doesn't need to be expensive. Yeah, five hundred dollars or less is the average cost for a reasonable accommodation, in according to the uh, according to Jan, the Job Access Network. And that I like that idea and thought, Steve. Right, is the the perception again is this is going to be expensive. There's going to be maybe a safety issue. How's this person going to get around the building? Or they're not going to be as productive. And and I agree that you'll find that part of the the loyalty and dedication has something to prove to themselves and to other people oftentimes, although we shouldn't have to prove ourselves, but you do. David, just looking at my, you know, my office, the setup I have in front of me, I have two enormous monitors on a really heavy duty stand. I have a really responsive mechanical keyboard. I have a really responsive mouse. And absolutely none of those costs are needed if you were to hire one of our clients. And these cost way more than the accessibility software. Mm-hmm. It's not even close. And, and that's just literally what's right, what I'm staring at right in front of me. So it is a myth that our clients are going to cost you more money. I'm going to cost you more money. And emphatically, I am not worth it. <laughs> no comment, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm biting my tongue. Right? <laughs> my comments are <laughs> First part of it, of it, Steve, is to admit, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah, and you know, and that's what I really like about the show. I'm bringing on you know experts and and really thought leaders like you guys who are making the difference and changing the perception of blindness and uh, helping transform people's lives by providing them the tools that they need to live independently. And to be able to, you know, get back to work, contribute to their family and contribute to society in terms of taxes and and things like that, which most people really don't like to do. But, you know, it's something that you it is a sense of pride and a sense of self-worth as as well. Right. So there's kind of an emotional uh, aspect of having a job or working. One of the things that I saw early on when I started at the foundation was individuals would come through our programs and and our comprehensive programs, someone can can come through these programs through vocational rehabilitation in the state of Arizona. And they could be there from nine months to a year. It depends on what skills they already have or where they're at in their life and um, what their vision is. And I would watch as students would make their journey through the program and and just gain this a little bit of swagger, confidence um, within the within the walls of FBC, right? And you know, take them out, and they'd go on their O and M lessons, and 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 they they'd nail it. And then they would graduate, and they didn't yet have a job, and then would follow up. What's going on? You know, how are you doing? Well, oh, I got you know, I got I got a rejection. I got a rejection. I got a rejection. And then you would just start to see the air deflate out of them because they felt like they could conquer anything when they walked out the door. And then they walked out and a month later, they still aren't employed and and they're frustrated and they're shutting down and they're discouraged. And so when I, when I started to see that, I encouraged our instructors or we made a shift and really started to talk a little bit more about um, that adjustment to when you're leaving a program, right? Mm-hmm. When you're leaving that comfortable space and that perseverance and again, using Steve's word, that grit, and you have to continue to stay connected and you have to treat getting a job as a job mm-hmm. and just push. And, you know, I am absolutely known within the organization of stalking people and <laughs> calling them and lighting a fire under them because I want people to know that they are capable and they can do that. And that one rejection or 10 rejections or a hundred rejections, it, it doesn't matter. They're going to end up finding that place where they feel at home and they feel um, like they're going to make a contribution and be a vital part of an organization. So that's really something that, you know, I observed was that once people 
would leave a pro leave our program initially, there was this d- deflation. And Steve, I, I don't know if you've experienced that with with your folks, um, but but we made a, a conscious pivot um, to really focus on giving people the skills and um, confidence and coping to to not get to that place to the degree that they can. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And one of the things that I like most about, you know, working here is that it's a community and it's a community that truly supports each other, each other. So yesterday there was an email that went out to all of our staff that one of our, our students had gotten a job. They'd been volunteering at our front desk while interviewing and every single person went up to the front desk and was celebrating because when one of you gets success, all of you get success. And I think that's one of the neatest things I've gotten to see. You know, in a world where people are elbowing their way through lines trying to get ahead of people to board a plane, right? To sit on a seat for five hours that is reserved for them, I might add. And then you see people celebrating each other's success that way. It, it's such a refreshment. It's such a refreshing point of view. Yeah. And I, I mean, I can just think, you know, employment is the end game, right? That's why Steve and I are both here. Not only is it um, National Disability Employment Awareness Month, but our full-time jam, if you would, is making sure that people are going to work. And and when we get those notifications from clients that they got a job or I had my my second interview and my third interview, and I announced that at a team meeting, I mean, it is like somebody won the lottery. There is just this resound, like just this roar of like applause and oh my gosh, and wow, that is fantastic. And, and then having those individuals come back and talk to current students to share their journey and possibilities. And, and we keep our doors open all the time so that our former students can come in and, and share the, their successes and, and even sometimes their failures and not just sometimes always their failures so that someone can, I guess, feel that they're not going to be alone. Mm -hmm. That's very important, right? Because you've been out of the workforce, retraining, as you're saying, getting the the tools you need to be successful in life and at work. And then you have that gap between looking for a job and then getting the job and and getting a job where, right, you feel value for the contributions you're bringing. And sometimes there's that gap and having the support system behind you is really important. I think a lot of times people forget how that process, that entire process works. From from your agencies, you know, when someone's thinking about hiring someone who's blind, what what does someone who is blind gone through? What does that training look like in your organizations? You know, it starts with independent living skills, right? Like how do you like you have to be able to take care of yourself first. It's that old adage, you have to put on, you know, your oxygen mask on the airplane before you can help somebody else. So it's independent living skills, it's computer skills, phone skills, and then it really shifts to what is your career goal. And then we start tailoring everything that we do around what is your career goal. So, you know, whether or not you want to be a school psychologist, we have somebody who's working towards that right now. Um, And we had someone uh, not that long ago who wanted to become a welder. And we worked with um, an outside consultant and designed the first of its kind welding helmet um, that had screen magnification in it. So that it did a digital magnifier in it. And they are currently a welder for the city of Phoenix. But we had to work to get them all the skills needed before they could put on that helmet, right? Designing the helmet was almost the easiest part. So, you know, we are working on the whole person to make sure that when they get that job, which is super hard, you, if you're on LinkedIn ever, read about the people who, independent of any ability whatsoever, have applied for 1,000 jobs, 2,000 jobs, and still don't have one and have been unemployed for long periods of time, and then add other barriers to that, mm-hmm. it gets harder. So we're working on the whole person so that when they get that job, they keep it and they're able to continue at that agency and be, you know, lifelong successful. Nothing is better than when they come back. You know, we had someone who got a really great job at Amazon. You were talking about Amazon earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, David, they're doing IT support at Amazon, helping people with their help desk calls um, in the IT field. 
And they came back. And when they were with us, they were at risk of losing their house. They had health challenges. They were trying to, um, they were only able to go to our program till 11 so that then they could go home and watch their children and their wife could work a full shift after that um, in order to support their family. And they came back with three boxes of donuts, which the donuts weren't all bad, um, <laughs> but it really was a, a giant shift, right, from someone who needed our food service in order to eat to providing food for his peers to show them what was possible. And it was a really great moment to watch him walk through the door, you know, carrying those donuts, extremely proud, wearing his Amazon shirt. It was a, it was a really great moment. And I know Julie has a million stories like that. And that is what these jobs aren't easy. And they certainly take plenty of time. Julie and I were talking about that earlier this week. That's what gets me out of bed, right? Is that success and that story and fighting for the next person to have that same ability. Steve, that story is amazing. I didn't know that. And I love the welding, mm -hmm. low vision. I'd love to see that. So, and I think that that's, we both have contracts with the state of Arizona for our programs, but that, what Steve, just shared is it's, it's beyond the various services, right? It's beyond the skills that we're teaching. Like it's this, it's this next level support and service that our agencies are providing to launch individuals so that they can go out and feel like they're contributing or know they're contributing and feel happy and come back and share the good news with with the programs and with their families. And, and I'm happy if I never see anybody again because they're working and that means that they are totally immersed in what they're doing and they're living their best life. And isn't that great? So the key, I think, to our programs is we both look at students as individuals. So wherever they're at um, in their journey, I've had some people come in and they're project managers. And so they're their true need that they needed was how are they going to utilize Atlassian or some kind of software with screen reader technology. And then I've had people come in who have been a homemaker their whole life, have had low vision their whole life, and then their spouse left them and they didn't know what to do. And so then you're actually building that person up as a person, not just about the skills, but you're also building them up with confidence to say, you can go and be independent and and do all of these things on your own. So we're always looking at each person uniquely and ensuring that we're meeting their needs so that they can ultimately be successful. Two really inspiring stories and, and insights because I think a lot of time you get lost is that they're not blind, right? They're people. Yep. And what and Julie, as you say, right, having state contracts, right? You're providing that service to do the training. But what you're really doing is working on that person. Mm -hmm. That's where I think it, it seems to get lost a lot when we're talking about blindness and we're talking about unemployment and we're talking about various different areas. But really when it comes down to it, it's, it's the individual. We're helping create self-esteem, awareness, building social networks. You know, that's what we do at, at our organization at AIB, right, is, is through employment through the opportunities to interact with your peers, sighted or, or blind, um, but you're making those networks, you're making those friendships, you have opportunities for advancement, right? If you, if you have the desire and drive uh, to do that, um, you want to find that pathway, that's really what it is, is motivating to the individual to have the opportunity to work. And we talk about the numbers and we talk about the challenges, but I think sometimes we lose the person. Yeah, the person is, that's what it's all about. I'm excited, love it when people get jobs, but I also want a whole person. And there's a concept in rehabilitation called orientation and adjustment to disability. But to me, what so much of that is, is your mental health and making sure that you are feeling like a whole person. And I know Steve's organization does a lot with support and wraparound services exceptionally well. But, you know, I cannot tell you how many times I've had someone come in my office and one story will stick with me forever is this individual who came in and it was a gentleman in his early 60s and he had been an accomplished chef and business owner. And 
And he was, he had come in and he had said, you, this place saved my life. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I lost hope. And that's, I think why, you know, Steve and I wake up and, and do what we do and think about it nonstop 24 seven, because there's always something else that needs to be done. And somebody else needs support. And, and that's why our organizations exist. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, you know, the reason Julie and I get along so well, I mean, other than the fact that I'm incredibly charismatic and a <laughs> wonderful person to be friends with. Yes. <laughs> the, yeah, absolutely. The reason we get along so well is that we both have, a, at the root of it, the same philosophy. When our clients come to us, they oftentimes are at a point in their life where they're not able to fight. And so we partner with them until they are able to fight on their own and help give them through the staff that we work with who are incredibly talented. We all provide to them all the tools they're going to need. But besides that, we are standing sometimes behind them, sometimes alongside them, sometimes in front of them, um, helping to clear obstacles, provide support, break down barriers. And by the time they are through our program, um, they're ready to do all that on their own. And that's why the mentorship piece, when they come back and they bring, whether or not they bring donuts or don't bring donuts, it means so much is because they're ready to help others with that journey the same way that we were able to help them. And I know Julie does that with her clients. Um, and I know that we do that here. And that really, I believe, is what, what is the foundation of the relationship that Julie and I have is is that we sometimes have different modalities of doing it, but we have the exact same end goals and the same philosophy in terms of we will do what needs to be done in order to help our clients get to where they need to go to. Yeah, that's amazing. And you know, as uh, an employer at AIB, we are fortunate that we're able to recruit the talented individuals from your organizations and various positions within our organization you know, whether it's direct labor or admin, uh, additional accounting, et cetera. And, you know, you'll find that when they're job ready, they're job ready, right? And they're, they're the whole person there. And, you know, when we find that uh, people are, who are struggling, right, does, do we make sure, that we have to make sure that there's the support systems there for them as well. Similar stories of someone that I was just speaking with, and at our organization who hadn't worked in a long time, lost uh, their vision later in life. And they felt very hopeless and like they just couldn't do anything. And they were at, at a point, like to admit, you know, someone that they felt that they no longer needed to live, that they couldn't contribute to their family. And coming and working at AIB has given them hope. They see their peers who were blind, low vision, working side by side with their sighted peers, et cetera. Then it gives them hope that, you know, I can do this and I want to do this. And then it just goes on to how do I help someone, that next person? And so the evolution of people, it, it's amazing to see when you have, you know, those the right supports around you. Yeah. yeah I, I also want to address though, David, that there is, you know, we've talked a lot about really great endings and great stories. And there's another side to it too, which is in the last 12 months among our client base, there have been eight suicide attempts and one success. We had one client unfortunately kill themselves. And so it is a super hard path for a lot of our people, mm -hmm. um, which makes all these supports and all that we do that much more important. So when Julie talks about you know, the services that she provided saved that person's life. I know that better than anybody mm -hmm. because I know the fight that we have with our clients is the exact same fight that she has with hers in terms of how do we ramp this up quickly enough, get the supports around quickly enough so we don't have suicide attempts, so we don't have all of these other things going on. And so, you know, the state provides funding for, um, the vocational services, but the rest of it, you have to figure that part out. And that is something that both Julie and I struggle with is 
how do you make all of that work so that the clients can achieve what not even they want to achieve beyond what they want to achieve beyond what they thought possible. Mm -hmm. But you have to start. And sometimes that beginning is particularly challenging and rocky. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's, um, it can be challenging for that individual that's coming through the program. And then you can compound that on to sometimes their family doesn't believe in them or they're just by themselves. And so it's, it's as standing up as many of those supports that you can and educating the, the community of providers that, you know, this is a, this is a real thing and, and we need you in here to help support our students so that they can go out and, and feel more confident and feel whole as a person, both mentally, physically, and in all aspects of their life. Yeah, you know, there's that, that great saying, if you want to go fast, go it alone. Mm -hmm. You want to go far, go as part of a team. And I yeah. know, I know Julie builds and creates community of foundation for blind children. And we strive to do the exact same year at Arizona Center for the Blind, yeah. both among our staff and our, and our clients. Mm -hmm. And you really try to create a team atmosphere where you're all pulling for each other. One of the things that brings me some of the most joy is when I get wind of a group chat of our students and they're organizing a outing to the old spaghetti factory or something like that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hearing the stories about, oh, so-and-so got, got stuck on the light rail and, and this and this, but nothing makes me more happy than to, to know and to close my eyes and, and, and picture, you know, that group of 10 or 12 students and their, and their families walking into old spaghetti factory and, you know, having a great meal and, and having a community. Mm -hmm. Camaraderie. Absolutely. So we're getting here to the top of the hour and end of our show. Steve, how, if people want to learn more about ACBVI, how would they uh, find out more about and get in contact with you to hear more of your words of wisdom? You would go to our website where exactly zero of my words of wisdom are, which is <laughs> www.acbvi.org. Um, or you can call at 602-273-7411. And, and, you know, the beauty of our agency is I am far and away the least talented person here. So you will be in good hands with whomever you get, either by, by email, internet, or by phone. Thank you. And Julie? Well, you can come on by our central campus location anytime you want at uh, 12th Street and Northern. It's 1234 East Northern Avenue. So really easy to remember. You can also visit our website at seeitourway.org. That's S-E-E-I-T. O U R W A Y dot O R G. Awesome. And again, thank you. You know, it just goes to show that with the right training, the right technology, and the right attitude, people who are blind are successful in the workplace. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to Changing the Perception of Blindness, one conversation at a time, with your host, David Steinmetz. Be sure to subscribe to Changing the Perception of Blindness, one conversation at a time on your favorite podcast platform and tune in live on Phoenix Business Radio X every third Friday at 9 a.m. We hope you feel inspired by today's conversation and maybe we've even sparked a new idea or opportunity.